just like to welcome each and every one of you here today, whether you're with us in person or whether you're online today. I want to first of all thank you for the generous Gideon offering that we received last week. We're able to give $2,308 for the distribution of Bibles. When we give, we have a part in the souls that are saved for the kingdom. I sometimes forget that. You know, you just give out a habit and you forget that. You know, you're investing in souls and you're a part of what the Gideon's reward is. You get a reward too. So last uh, few weeks, we've had the list of needs for the Kentucky mission were passed out. And if you did not have one or you haven't been here, there are additional lists on the information table. For anyone new, we collect items for the poor in the mountains of Kentucky. We collect September 29th, which is only two weeks away. Now, if shopping is hard for you, you can bring, you can ask Connie Gundy. Connie, would you stand up in case there's somebody here that doesn't know who you are? She's the one that you can give your money to, and she will shop for you. Or you can just write a check out to Living Waters Mission, put it in the offering, or give it to Connie. Because it's Connie and Dan and that go down to the mission and deliver things. So Connie kind of is the in-charge person for this, this trip. Um, this month we take our turn at the sharing kitchen in Faustoria. So it's coming up the last of the month and it's kind of tricky because the Monday's in October and the Wednesday's in November. So you could get discombobulated real easy. So mark it on your calendar if you're able to serve either Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. We serve from 4.30 to 5.30. You arrive at 4.15, and you are done pretty promptly at 5.30. You are out of there. The address is 319 North Union Street, and all you have to do is serve food. You don't have to cook. We do a little help with cleanup, but it's a very easy thing to do and really a lot of fun to work with other people who are serving the poor. So the blind is still showing. So if you haven't been here and you don't know about the blind, it is the life story of Phil and Kay Robertson. And it is very inspirational, has a lot of life lessons in there. And I haven't heard anyone say that they did not enjoy the movie. Phil and Kay were on Duck Dynasty, if you watch that on TV. So I think that takes care of our announcements for today. So the children may line up at the back door and a teacher will take you over to Kids Church. Thank you. And the Sharing Kitchen is at 319 Main Street, Foster, Ohio. In case you thought it was on Union Street, it's Main Street. <laughs> I love correcting people. Um, I have a few prayer requests. Um, the ushers can come forward now. Um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Ken Keckler um, from Faustoria, he's um, been diagnosed with bone cancer. I want to keep him in prayer. Some of you remember Lee Coppler. Lee was a lady who came to church in Faustoria. Mm -hmm. Lee's daughter, Charlotte, is uh, going to have some surgery for a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And I uh, so want to keep her in prayer. And... Uh, Continue to pray for Israel. You know, sometimes if you don't know how to pray, say, Lord, just keep your hand upon that whole situation. You know, sometimes it's, it's difficult, but God's in charge. And things, some things are going to happen. Some things are going to happen irregardless of what goes on. You know, some things are a matter of appointed times. And if it's an appointed time, there's certain things just going to happen. So we need to keep praying for them. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our concerns and our prayers. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, be with Israel, and Lord, just continue to keep your hand upon them. Lord, we pray that your spirit would continue to be poured out. Lord, that people be drawn to you. Lord, that through this time, the most important thing is that people would be drawn to you and come to know you. So, Lord, just work in hearts of, of everyone involved. Lord, uh, just draw them to you. Lord, we pray for Ken... We just pray that you just be with him through this time, and, and Lord, just uh, touch his body. We pray for healing, and Lord, just encourage him and help him to look to you and to trust you. And also for Charlotte, we pray you be with her. She has this surgery tomorrow. Lord, we just pray you'd be with the doctors and just guide them and, and just direct them as they do this surgery. Lord, just touch her and help her to trust you and to look to you for all that she needs. Lord, we thank you for 
for just being with us. We thank you for your guidance, your direction. And Lord, just help us to keep our eyes on you. There's so many things that can distract us and, and get our attention in other places. But Lord, just help us to remember that we can trust you and you're the one that we look to. So Lord, just help us keep our eyes on you. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the privilege we have to give. We just ask you to bless this offering now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was thinking about it. How do you say I love you to the Lord? How do we tell him? How do we tell him we love him? I remember there used to be a, a song we'd sing in worship. I love you, Lord. I lift up my voice. You know, that was a direct, I love you, Lord. You know, that was a saying, we love him. And also, when we say something like that, what's implied? Are there things that are implied when we say, I love you? You know, I believe love is an action word. It's not just a statement. You know, I believe when you say, I love you, there's things that go along with it. You know, sometimes people say, well, words are cheap. And basically, words are cheap. You can say anything. What does it really mean? What does it really mean? So I want to look at some of the scriptures that I believe help us to understand what that means when we say, I love you, Lord. The first one is in Psalms 18, verses 1 and 2. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. You know, in Psalms 18, he says, I will love you, O Lord. It's a statement. It's a statement. I believe we make statements of faith. I love you, Lord. I believe we sing during worship. I love you, Lord. You know, whether it's speaking or singing or however we might do it, we take time to say it, to express our love for God, for who he is, for what he's done. You know, that verse goes on to acknowledge who he is. He says, Lord, I love you. You're my strength. You're my strength. It's not, it's not my strength, but you're my strength. You know, the Apostle Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong, because he knew it wasn't his strength. It was the strength that the Lord gives. So sometimes we can feel pretty weak. We can feel distressed. We can feel forsaken. Pretty down. But at those times, we can still be strong. Because my strength is in the Lord. It's not how I feel. You know, if your strength isn't how you feel, some days you don't feel so strong. You know, I don't feel so strong. But my strength is in the Lord. So I don't have to feel strong. I don't have to feel strong. My strength is in Him. Lord, you're my strength. Sometimes we just need to acknowledge that, Lord, you know, you're the strength that I have. You're the strength that I have. That's hard sometimes when we're young, because when we're young, we have lots of strength. And so when I say, well, you know, your strength is in the Lord, young people say, well, why do I need that? I'm strong. I kind of do what I want. I go where I want. I can make happen whatever I want. I'm strong. And then life messes with you. Things happen. Things happen. Circumstances come. Things happen. And sometimes we don't feel so strong. Because if we're honest, a lot of times, our strength in ourself doesn't make it. You know, sometimes I can feel pretty weak and helpless. And so, Lord, I love you because you're my strength. You're my strength. And he goes on to say, you're my rock. You're my rock. You're my foundation. You're the one that I can stand on. You're the one that holds me up. Amen. You're the basis of, of who I am. You, on you is established all that exists in myself. Yes. Lord, you're my rock. My rock. And you're my rock when all else is sinking sand. Amen. You know, the song's on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So it's not unusual to have times when everything else feels like sinking sand. I'm sure, I'm sure people in, in Palestine, they've got to feel like 
everything around them is sinking sand. You know, I've thought about all that they're going through. And I think about, yeah, that's terrible, and we say how terrible it is. But isn't it amazing how life here just keeps on going? I mean, you know, people over there have no water, no electricity. They have no, they run out of food. And no matter what you think, that's a pretty distressing situation. Some would say, well, maybe they deserve it. I, that's not the issue. I don't want what I deserve, so I don't know if they should get what they deserve. But anyway, that's what's happening. And they're, in, they're on sinking sand. You know, where are they going to turn? Hopefully, they turn to the Lord. Hopefully, in the midst of this, they turn to Him. Don't know what they'll turn to. But it just reminds me that, you know, until it happens to me, I can kind of isolate myself from the whole thing. You know, life goes on. We all watch football. We all celebrated because our team won or maybe lamented because they lost. Isn't that interesting? Do you think any Palestinians cared what Ohio State did yesterday? Just something to think about. You know, kind of maybe get, 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 sometimes we need to get focus. You know, and we can say, well, that's what happened over there. Well, sometimes things can happen here. What would we do? Where's my rock? Where's, my, where's the solid place that I stand when all else is sinking sand? He goes on to say, he's my fortress. Where do I go for help? A fortress is a place you go for help and security when the enemy comes. A place to hide in. You know, a place that makes you feel secure. Safe. At peace. You know, sometimes we get those places in life, you know. I don't know about you, but you know, you might have a place where, you know, I just feel good when I'm there. You know? Sometimes it could be a place. It could be a place we go to. You know, it could be somewhere where we've had good experiences. Just good, good memories. Like, oh, I feel so good when I'm there. You know? I, I, life, all the storms of life don't matter because that's a place where I can go and feel safe. Well, that's what God says. You know, he wants to be to us. He wants to be our fortress. He wants to be where we go. You know, there's an old song that says, I hide myself in the cleft of the rock. You know, that's a place, a fortress, a place of security. You know, that's what he's supposed to be in. Lord, I love you because you're my fortress. You're that place. And you're my deliverer. You're the one that sets me free. You're the one that delivers me from sin. You're the one that delivers me from the things going on around me. Lord, you're the one that I look to and I can trust you. And I love you for that. I love you. So we express it with our words. We sing, I love you. And then in 1 John, the second chapter, the fifth verse, it says, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. If the love of God is truly in us, if we truly love him, we're going to keep his word. His word. His word's going to be important to me. The word of God. What does God say? You know, so many times things go on around us and we, we know what everybody else says. We know what I think. You know, I know what I say. I know what people say. I listen and people say things. Media says all kinds of things. But what does the Word of God say? What does God's Word say? How important is that to me? It says, if I love Him, I'm going to keep His Word. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to know what it says. Well, first you've got to know what it says. If you're going to keep it, you've got to know what it says. The only way to know what it says is to read it or to hear it. You have to hear the word of God. You have to hear it. You have to know what it says. Then we trust it. We put our trust in what God says. 
You know, I think sometimes we get so caught up with everything around us. You know, we forget some of the basics of what God has said. I always share that scripture a lot. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. I think that's something more and more we need to really get inside of us. Because there's a lot of lying going on. There's a whole lot of lying going on. There's people telling us a whole lot of stuff that's not true. And we need to know what the Word of God says. Where do I put my trust? If I love Him, I'm going to keep His Word. I'm going to keep it. Because He gives me life. He gives me life. I'm going to keep it inside of me. I'm going to keep it inside of me. My mom... My mom always said, you got to memorize scripture. You know, she kept, you know, you got to memorize. Someday, she said, someday you're going to need it. And if it's in you, then you'll have it. How much do we have in us? How much of his word is in us? How much of his word do we know? Do we keep? So that when things happen... We can rely on Him. We can rely on Him. Because we love Him. We love Him. It says if we love Him, we'll keep His word. We're going to keep it. 1 John, the third chapter, the seventh verse, says, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? And then Jesus told Peter in... John 21, 17, he says, if, if we love God, we're going to meet the needs of others. If you love me, feed my sheep. He told Peter, if you love me, take care of others. If we love him. We can say we love him. I love God. But if we love him, what are we doing about others? What's my attitude about other people? What's my attitude about those in need? It says, if we shut up our heart from him, if we don't pay attention. You know, sometimes we can become kind of sarcastical about people's needs. And sometimes, but sometimes you know, people are in need and they, they're in need because they deserve it. So if they deserve it, then I can ignore them. That's not really what it says. The Bible does say if you don't work, you don't eat. So I think there's some, some things that need to come into this. But what's my attitude? What's my attitude if I see someone in need? And it says, and shuts up his heart. You know, when I see somebody in need, do I have compassion? Is there something in me has compassion? Now, you can have compassion for that person's need, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do something. But please don't get hard. You know, we still should have that compassion, but sometimes, you know, you can't always do what somebody wants. You know, you can't always meet their needs. Sometimes there's other things going on. But I think as Christians, if we have, we need to look at people and we need to see when people have needs. Wherever we are. Wherever we are. You know, I, I can't always worry about the poor in the world. I don't think God expects me to be responsible for the poor in the world. I don't have that kind of capability. But it says, whoever sees his brother in need. So that tells me it's got to be somebody a little closer. Somebody I can actually see or come across or be around. And so I have to be very careful that when I see in my, in my world, in my space, in my area of influence, if there's people in need, then I need to consider 
that if the love of God abides in me, that I should have compassion and do what I can to help. Do what I can to help. It's sad to me that I think in our society, and I don't know what responsibility the government has, but what's happened in our society over the years is the church, the people of God, gave up the responsibility to take care of the poor, and we've depended upon the government to do it. And surprise, surprise, now we're all mad at how the government does it. Isn't that interesting? When I think maybe the blame falls at the foot of the church. I think the church's responsibility was to care for the poor. It was the church. You know, there was a day when that's who took care of the poor. It was the church. And the people of God relinquished that to the government. Maybe they're trying to do their best. I don't know. It's a mess, but I don't know if it's their best. But I think when God's people give up what they're supposed to do to the government, you're going to get a mess. That's just kind of my thing. I had somebody one time says, I don't tithe anymore, I pay taxes because that money goes to help the poor. And I thought, what? But that's how they kind of worked it out in their head. That taxes were their tithe because the government's helping the poor. Now that just shows you where we've come. Now, it would be a real challenge to get that wrestled away from the government and convince them that the church is going to now take care of the poor. That would be a real challenge. But what I think is, as God's people, we have to take responsibility for what we have responsibility for. That we look around and you see where you have responsibility. If I see my brother in need and shut up my heart, how can you say you love God? Or if I say I love God and do it, I must be lying. I don't really love God. So sometimes, you know, words are cheap. Talk is cheap. Oh, I love God. I love you, Lord. But I don't see nothing else. I don't see anything else. So if we love God, we're compelled. Something inside of us ought to compel us to love others and see their needs. Something inside of us. If the love of God, if I love God and he's in me, then surely the love of God inside of me would want to help. That I would have compassion. Sometimes we can't always physically help. You know, we can pray. Prayer is not an excuse for not helping, but sometimes that's what we need to do, is pray. We pray, we share, we love, we have compassion. We get involved Sometimes it's a lot easier to give some money than it is to get involved. Sometimes it's a lot easier. Sometimes it's a lot easier. 1 John 4.20 If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? You can't say, I love you, Lord, and hate Somebody else. Hate. Hate's a strong word. You know? Jesus said, if you hate, it's the same as murder. Oh, my. That's, that's pretty strong. That's pretty strong. Well, hate's a strong word. You know? Personally, I don't think we should ever say it about another person. It even bothers me when kids say, oh, I hate, I hate broccoli. You know, you can say, you know, I, it just bothers me. Now, you can say, I don't want any, I don't, I don't like broccoli, that's, that's fine, but, you know, it's just a personal thing with me. That hate's such a strong word that I tend not to want to say it. I tend not to want to verbalize it. Now, are there people that I don't like being around? Probably. 
But I would never say, I hate you. You know? And I think, you know, God would say to us, you know, that's something we should never say about another person. I hate you. And if we do, we're, li we're lying. The love of God doesn't exist in us if we say that. And Jesus even said some things that challenge me all the time. He says, well, you should even love your enemies. Love your enemies. How's that work? How's that work? We're, we're taught a lot of hate. We're, we're taught a lot of divisiveness. You know, it, it, it permeates throughout our lifestyle sometimes without even knowing it. And so when Jesus says, love your enemies, it's like, whoa. So then I kind of work through that and I go, okay, you know, I'll love my enemies. Well, then he puts another, then he adds to it. He says, well, actually, do good to those that persecute you. Now, loving my enemies, I can go, okay, I love my enemies, but I'm not getting around them. Okay? But then when he said, well, how about if you do good to those that persecute you? Whoa! Whoa! Whoa, who, who does that? Who does that? Do good to those that persecute you? People that come against you? People that say things about you? Do good. I know one of the, one of the young girls that we bring to church, and they're back there so they can't hear me, but um, <laughs> they were talking the other week about, well, everybody at school hates me. And, you know, if kids, I know, it's kids, but it's kids. And sometimes we all act like kids, so, you know, bear with me. But, you know, well, the, the, the kids, the girls, they, they hate me. They say stuff about me. And, and I said, oh, first of all, ignore them. I said, actually, if you're nice to them, they'll probably change around next week. You know, because, you know, kids are kind of like that. And a lot of times you can... You can do good and kind of, they'll go, oh, well, okay. I guess I'll be your friend. Adults don't always do it that quick. You know, we don't always do that. But I think there's a part of us that needs to say, you know what? Maybe somebody was having a bad day when they said what they said. Let's, let's just give it up for a bad day. Or maybe, maybe, you know, maybe they don't understand the truth. So I think we have to be very careful that when we say I love God, that we are willing to love other people. And even those that rub us the wrong way. Rub us the wrong way. You know, there seems to be a lack of the love of God in our, in our nation, in our society. Oh, we can give lip service and say, I love you. But, you know, Jesus says, well, if you say you love, then I want you to do good. I want you to love your enemies. You know, and that's just a whole nother, a whole nother step. A whole nother step. 1 John 5, 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And in John 14, 21, it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. God expects us to keep his commandments. The things he says. And I believe he expects us to keep his commandments even if we don't know what they are. Ignorance is no excuse. A lot of times I think the danger is that we don't even know what his commandments are. We don't even know what he said. And so we don't, well, 
you know, we just do what we want. We kind of live in la-la land. Ignorance will be no excuse. Can you imagine standing before God someday and saying, oh, I didn't know that was wrong. What do you think he's going to say? Oh, okay, I'll let you off. <laughs> he's going to go, what's he going to say? I, no, no, I'm not pretending to be God. But I, I would think he would go, and he probably doesn't do this, but he would probably say, did you read my word to know what my commandments are? Did you even know what they are? Did you even care? Uh, you know, uh, let's see. What's my answer? <laughs> uh, you know, not. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. So he expects us to keep his commandments. And it says, it's not burdensome to us. I have a desire. It's my desire to obey and keep his commandments. It's not burdensome. You know, sometimes we hear his commandments, we go, oh no, is there, is there any way around that? Oh, is that real? Oh, you don't have to do that. People don't do that no more. Oh, everybody's not doing it. You know, what's, what's my approach to his commandments? If we love him, we'll obey him. So when we say, I love you, Lord, I think it's important for us to remember that that has a lot of implications. That that says a lot about what we do. What we do. That our words mean something. That, you know, it actually means something. And that I actually live like I love him. Because if I love him, I'm going to do these things. Now, granted, we're not going to be perfect. You know? But perfection doesn't mean that you give up and don't try. It says, it says you know, his commandments aren't burdensome. I want to do them. I desire to do them. I'm not looking for an out. I'm not looking for an excuse. Yes, I'm not going to do it perfectly. You know, yes, I'll fail. But that's not my desire. That's not my desire. And I don't, hold, I don't hold other people up as the example. Because a lot of times what we do when we hold up people as an example, we find somebody that's really messing up and go, well, I'm better than them. You know, well, at least I don't do that. That's not who we should be comparing ourselves to. And the Bible says, be ye therefore holy as I am holy. It's a pretty high standard. It's a pretty high standard. I believe as Christians, we need to respond. Respond. We need to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. That we do what the word of God says. We do it. We do it because he loved us and we love him. That's my motivation. You know, my, and my motivation is to get brownie points. My motivation isn't to get some kind of, okay, good job. My motivation is because he loved me, that I love him. And I want to obey him. I want to do what he said. So the next time you think about, I love you, Lord. You know, just be reminded of what that means. Be reminded that, you know, if we're going to love him, then we need to act accordingly. We need to act accordingly and do what he's told us to do. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you loved us. You loved us first. And because of your great love for us, Lord, we can love you. We can love you. We can love you for who you are. For who you are for what you're doing, for what you've done, and for what you're going to do. But most of all, for what you've done for us. Lord, even when we didn't deserve it, you sent your son to die on a cross for us. When we did not deserve it, you loved us. So Lord, help us to express that love to those around us. 
Lord, help us to love when it's hard. It's not always easy to love. Sometimes, sometimes it's going to be hard. So, Lord, help us to love the way you love. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us be faithful to your word. Help us to love your word and what you say. So, Lord, then when things come against us, when, when life comes against us, when things look hopeless, Lord, we can stand on the solid rock. We can stand upon you and who you are and what you've done. So, Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you for being with us. Lord, help our eyes to be open this week for opportunities to love those around us. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.